Ladies and gentlemen, angry Americans around the country and around the world, welcome to Los Angeles. I come to you live from the hallowed and relatively new and very fancy studios of Crooked Media. And we have a very, very special, timely, important, inspiring, interesting guest, the great and powerful Jameel Smith. What's up? How you doing? I'm good. I'm Welcome good. to L.A., brother. Thank you, dude. You're not, always, you're not from here originally. Hell no. So I don't the, know if I should actually be welcoming you here. Uh, no, but I appreciate the uh, fact that you did. Thank you. But I, I am, you know, I'm a, I'm a Clevelander transplanted here. Yeah. Born and raised Clevelander. But uh, yeah, I've been here. I've been out here long enough. I think that I can, you know, maybe be on the welcome committee. Don't you find that people who are not from here welcome people who are not from here more often? Well, I think there's enough people. <laughs> I mean, like there's <laughs> there's so many people who aren't from here <laughs> yeah. that live here. Uh, I mean, it's 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 actually rare that you run into a a born and raised Angelino. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of us transplants, especially so, a lot of us Clevelanders out here. Yeah, I want to talk about Cleveland. I want to talk about a lot of things. But first of all, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask of of all our guests because we are here in California. Uh, Jamil Smith, what is your drink of choice? Uh, Red Stripe, sir. Brewed in Jamaica. Yes, I, I love uh, a good. First of all, I love a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jamaican beer. You know, I, I mean, first of all, it's it's got a nice little spice to it. Um, it comes in a particularly unique bottle, um, and it's something that you know when I was first starting to get a taste for beer, uh, just really appealed to me. So absolutely, know. well, salute. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great choice. Well, it's a fact that it's uh, brewed by black folks. Oh, no, not, yes. Not a bad thing. No, and it is also. I don't know if anybody on this show to date has chosen a beer. Huh. And, and that's an excellent choice. Of all the beers, like, I feel like Red Stripe is a fucking home run. Like, the bottle is amazing. You know, the inspiration that it brings, the taste, it's like, you know. Yeah. And if you've ever had a Red Stripe in Jamaica, it just kind of compounds the experience and makes it that much more memorable. But you're right about the bottle. Yeah. The bottle is, like, unique. It feels old school. It also feels like, you know, from my dark, it feels uniquely throwable. Doesn't it it's make like you feel like bit. you're on a beach, though, a little bit? It does. It does. It does. But I love that choice. And we're going we're gonna to drink some Red Stripe here while we have a conversation about all the amazing and interesting and wild and weird shit that's going on in the world. We come to you today uh, fresh out of New Hampshire, yeah. fresh out of Iowa, fresh out of the State of the Union, fresh out of the Oscars, fresh out of the Super Bowl. And these are all things that you're uniquely positioned to talk about. Like, you sit at this really unique intersection between politics and race and culture and sports. Yeah. So it, it's kind of an, a great time to be you. <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> not too bad. And not a bad town to be in, for yeah. sure. So let's start with um, la last night. Well, we're, we're coming to you recording on Wednesday. This will drop on Thursday. Uh, New Hampshire is over. We actually have a conclusion, unlike in, in Iowa. Yeah. What are your top line takeaways, Jamil? Well, first things first, uh, I mean, Bernie Sanders, you know, let's start with, you know, who actually won as opposed to uh, talking about what big nights uh, the second and third place people did uh, that did have. I mean, I think the cable news networks were, I think, a little too obsessed with that. Let's talk about who actually won. I mean, Bernie Sanders, uh, I think, is showing signs of uh, being the only candidate who's actually able to form a working coalition, um, younger people. Uh, not just uh, younger people, but a diverse uh, coalition of younger people uh, that, he, you know, I think he, he, he people say that, you know, you can't win races with uh, younger voters uh, ages 18 to 25. Well, uh, you know, he's turning out people, uh, frankly, you know, diverse crowds in Iowa and New Hampshire, which which, frankly, you don't really see. Um, and he's bringing in folks uh, maybe who have been disenchanted uh, previously by the political process. I'm interested to see where this goes uh, going forward in uh, Nevada and uh, in South Carolina for sure. Can that appeal uh, be translated into uh, states that are you know considerably more diverse and offer different challenges? So I want to I want to go through a lot of the candidates with you and get your unique perspective in, 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 on all of them. But I also want to talk about the intersection of class and race and diversity, which I think is one of the most underreported under. Uh, un un misunderstood uh, and, and just an area that lacks focus in understanding our politics in part because I feel like white people especially don't know how to talk about it or are uncomfortable talking about it. Right. And um, despite all the efforts for diversity, you know, a lot of the media narratives are still driven by white people and driven from outside of places like Iowa and outside of places like New Hampshire. 
but the intersection around Bernie Sanders is particularly fascinating. And, and so let, let me ask you, um, what is it about Bernie? Why, why do young people of color, why are they interested in Bernie Sanders? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I talk to younger people of color that are intrigued by Bernie Sanders, they see a person who is driven to attack problems that inherently disadvantage people of color, or I, without using that term, black, Hispanic, indigenous people more acutely than they do other, you know, other Americans in general. So, you know, here's a guy who has a uh, who has plans that are going to attack these disproportionate discrimination discriminatory issues more. You know, uh, yeah, I guess you could say um, more uh, to the point than say you know Elizabeth Warren or or any of these other moderate candidates. So they see a guy who's really going to solve the problem. They don't care what package it comes in. They see, uh, they don't care if it's socialist or how it's branded. They see a guy who's actually going to work with them uh, to solve the problem. I see a little bit of a problem with that thinking. Um, with you have a guy who's you know who's who's, who's branded himself as a democratic socialist. Well. You, he's going to have to work with or, you know, get through a campaign. How then are other Americans, you know, going to take and understand Bernie Sanders? Uh, Republicans are inevitably, if he becomes the nominee, going to brand him as a communist. Right. They're just going to. Right, right. They need right. to have a plan for how they're going to get him through to the presidency. What is the plan? Uh, I've, so let me I've ask, yet to understand it. Yeah. What, how are they going to pay for the Medicare for All plan? We don't yet really have the explanation for that. Um, there are things about his campaign that trouble me. Uh, the class versus race analysis. Uh, you know, there are things that trouble me about that. I, I just, there, frankly, there are things that he has come forward on. Um, he speaks very passionately about the need to eliminate racism in our society, about the need to eliminate misogyny. Um, I believe Bernie when he says these things because he's done the work uh, as an activist. Uh, I believe, listen, we don't need to be, uh, have me be convinced on these things. But what I need to see from him are the embrace of race-conscious policy uh, in the way that... Um, I, I think, you know, he's done with class, Yeah. you know, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we understand that you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can, in fact, you know, put forward uh, policy that, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, if you put forward policy that addresses class, yes, inevitably that is going to have an effect on, uh, you know, certainly, you know, people, um, black and Hispanic folks, maybe disproportionately. But I need him to understand how I need it to incorporate that directly into the policy. Yeah. And I, I, I need that. I don't know. I just need it to be a little bit more explicit. Can, can I ask you to, to drill down on something that <clears throat> sorry, that I think I hear from a lot of folks in, in a bit. And do you trust him? Like there's a point of him that he's 78 years old. Mm -hmm. OK, he is. He's an old dude. Mm -hmm. OK. And he's operating in a very, very dynamic environment mm -hmm. and on a very basic level. You know, I've got plenty of criticisms about Bernie Sanders. I've worked alongside Bernie Sanders. I've worked against Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And at times he is an ideologue. Yeah. He is. You can argue that he's so principled. He's always been the same way. Or you can argue that he doesn't move. And that's why more things don't get done. Right. right? When he was the chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, he packed everything into, into omnibus bills and said, you got to vote for the whole thing or nothing. Right. And oftentimes Republicans would just say no and they'd vote against it and we'd have nothing. Right. So uh, that's one component is like the practical component of it. But he's an old guy who seems to you know, be hanging on. He's got a lot of great surrogates who are very dynamic, who understand the media environment. I feel like he's a slip away from a Biden moment. Mm. And, and I wonder if other folks are worried about that. If he wasn't Bernie Sanders and someone told you, I got this profile of guy. And he's from Vermont. He's 78 years old. He's white. He's like, you know, he, this is what he, what he stands for. I don't know how many people would trust him not to screw it up. 
Well, here's a, here's a couple things. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I understand that. And I, I don't – look, I've never met Bernie Sanders. I've never had a conversation with Bernie Sanders. Uh, it's tough for me to answer that question on, a, on an empirical level. What I – well, here's the thing. Here's a couple things I am concerned about with Bernie Sanders. Number one is with regards to his health. He's 78 years old. He's had an incident with his health during this campaign, and we still don't know nearly enough about his health. He, he won't release his health records. Yeah. And w most recently, as like recently as this week, w you know, we've had inquiries about his health, and they're still cagey about releasing his health records. Why won't you release your health records? Just do it. Yeah. That, and that's a core issue, right? Because he wants to contrast himself with the dishonest Donald Trump, right? right. Who, who he's going to say is a guy you can't trust. He's the most disastrous president in history. But also, when you look across the landscape, Jamil, you got Biden's late 70s, Trump's late 70s, uh, Sanders' late 70s, Warren is close, Pelosi is close. Mm -hmm. Like, if you picked five people in their late 70s, early 80s, the likelihood that all five of them would live one year is low. Well, I mean, one of them is probably going to get sick or potentially die. That, that, that's a mm -hmm. statistical reality, right? So when you talk about Bernie in particular, a guy who's flying around all the time, who's got tremendous pressure, you know, the physical demands of being on a campaign are very high. So I, th I think his yeah. age is an issue, but even mm -hmm. more so, it's the issue of transparency. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like he's holding himself to, to a lower standard here than he wants to hold other people to. Yeah, and I wouldn't necessarily group Warren in there with her with them. I think she's about 70 or 71. Yeah. You know, if you see her on a yeah. stage, she's, you know, bouncing around like she's sure. 20 years sure, older but, than that. But plenty but, of 70-year-olds have heart attacks out of the blue who run marathons all yeah, the time, right? Yeah, like, plenty of people our age. Could happen, right? <laughs> do that, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, but to me, it's about, it's, it's less about, Sanders's age, the, the fact that he's had a recent incident that is telling me that, hey, we need to see your health records. So there's, there's that. But also, his recent statement that he didn't truly understand uh, the seriousness, and I'm paraphrasing here, of systemic racism until he ran for president? I mean, think about That's how, what I'm talking about. Think about That's how long about. he's been in office. Think about how long he's been in politics. And in the, 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 the most troubling thing about that statement to me is you didn't understand it until you ran for president? Yeah. I mean, it took you running for president to, un, to, to grasp the seriousness of this? What about running for president made you grasp that? Yeah. So does he become, for people, uh, you know, we keep saying young people, and if people of color is not an appropriate or accurate term and is a better way to phrase it, please help me. Help me. Well, I just like to be more specific yeah, because okay. I, I just, you know, with people of color, I think there are some people I know certainly within our business don't like that term. So I just want to be more specific um, in terms of speaking about um, those communities because all of them have different needs and, right, and, right. and, and specific uh, interests. So when, when I, it's not about necessarily using using the, the term, but what 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 I want to say is. You know, I think you have with uh, Sanders, you know, he, he's not the only one for me that has, I've got real concerns about. Yeah. I've got real concerns about uh, people. Can, can we stand him for a second? Though? Yeah. I want to yeah. ask you this. Are people, you know, the wide varieties of people that we're talking about, whether it's young people or, or Hispanics, are a lot of people looking at him in the same way evangelicals looked at Trump mm. in that they said, you know what, he's he's not exactly who we want, but he's what we got. And I think he's going to stand up for what I believe in, so I'm going to pull the lever for him. It, it, it seems to me like a parallel. And also, similarly, and, and I think it's like – I've been looking for an opportunity to focus on Sanders on this podcast, and I think this is the time. There's also a point of what he and Andrew Yang both bring to especially young people, which is promising you free shit. Mm. Right. And Andrew Yang is smart. He leads with, you know, I'm going to get everybody a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. When George Bush, uh, George W. Bush got elected, he gave everybody an immediate tax rebate. Bernie Sanders is saying, I'm going to give you free college. I'm going to erase all your debt. And if you're a new voter, regardless of what your, your gender or ethnic breakdown is, you know, that is something that may bring you in the fold. Right. It may bring mm -hmm. you forward. If you say, hey, I'm going to make college free. Mm -hmm. Right. That that brings me into the tent. It gets me engaged. He sounds like a guy who I can talk to. But on some levels, Bernie Sanders is selling bullshit. Right. Like we know it. Like those of us who've worked in politics, I think, really do believe that, that somebody's got to call out Bernie Sanders for selling the impossible dream. Like some of this is unrealistic to, this week. Uh, the, the V.A., it, it just announced they're delaying the the implementation of the electronic record keeping system at the V.A., 
That is a system that they've been trying to reform since the early 2000s. I stood at a press conference with Barack Obama in 2009, mm -hmm. and he stood up and said, we're going to fix it. Every president says this dream that they're going to make the VA amazing. They're going right. to make it wonderful. Everybody's going to get a free puppy and all the, you know, the, the, the electronic record keeping is going to be like walking into an Apple store, right? And everybody says it, but nobody ever checks the receipts. Nobody ever comes back and holds Barack Obama accountable now in 2020 for the fact that that was 11 years ago, right? Like they've been talking about fighting the bureaucracy of the VA longer than we've actually been fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So I, I wonder, you know, you're, you're an expert on culture. Like, you, you mm -hmm. worked in, in football, you've worked in, in many different medias, you write for Rolling Stone, you sit at a lot of different intersections. Like, is there a part of this is just salesmanship? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also the son of a veteran, you know, who's yeah, had to right. recently navigate the VA's bureaucracy himself. And I, you know, I, I see, you know, how ridiculous that is, you know, to, to say to veterans, hey, we're going to fix this, uh, and it's going to make it sound like it's easy. Uh, it's almost offensive. Uh, but isn't it equally offensive for Sanders to say he's going to get rid of everybody's college debt? Well, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think here's the thing. I think that it's something to shoot for, but you got to explain how you're going to do it. Right. That to me, I, I think he, here's what I, I, I don't like when Amy Klobuchar says that, hey, I think this is unrealistic and we shouldn't even try. That I don't like. I don't want to hear somebody. I don't want to hear a politician tells me tell me no. This is too too going to be too hard, and we're, we shouldn't even try. And w you know, let's just shoot for something that's easier to do. I don't want, don't don't be a politician. Tell me tell me that. Oh, tell me what's realistic. And you know, I, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear somebody tell me you're going to shoot high, and then I want you to have a plan for how you're going to do it. But then I also want you to have a plan for, okay, if it fails, here's what we're going to try to do next. Right. That's what, that's what, I need, that's what I'm hiring you to do. Right. I, want you, I want to hire you to do, have plan A, plan B, and plan C. So what I'm hearing from Bernie Sanders is that he has plan A. Right. And what's yeah, next? Yeah. On a very basic level, right, the, the criticism about whether or not Bernie Sanders can win, okay, versus mm -hmm. Trump, I think is very important. And, and you, uh, you have written about many of the candidates, mm -hmm. and you've also written about you know, some of the candidates that you say, even if they can win, it's not enough to nominate them because there are bigger issues, yes. right? Like Michael Bloomberg. You've written a piece about Michael Bloomberg. You've yes. been very critical of Michael Bloomberg. I think the argument now, as Biden uh, falls, right, mm -hmm. and, and, and Sanders ascends, and you've got this kind of, you got Sanders and you got Warren on one side, and then you got Klobuchar, Buttigieg, and Biden. Yes. Right. I don't think I'm missing anybody. Yang is out today now. Deval Patrick is out now. A lot of people are falling quickly. Right. So you're going to have a choice to make within the Democratic Party of either Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders or Buddha Judge and likely Biden. Right. And, and, and looking, Amy Klobuchar. And, and, and Amy Klobuchar. Right. Who knows how that'll shake out? But they're, they're disparate tribes. Right. Right. On the battlefield. And then if this is Game of Thrones. Right. Then you got the dragon. That is Bloomberg, okay? <laughs> and he comes flying in. And I use, Bloom I use Bloomberg. Uh, the dragon example is good, right? Because in my view, yeah. Democrats are shitting on Bloomberg for a lot of the wrong reasons, right? If you're, if you're in a fight, you want a dragon, right? And if you don't get the dragon, you know what happens? The White Walkers will take the dragon, right? And, and everybody who says, you know, B Bloomberg should be out of this, independent of his electability, mm -hmm. I welcome his resources. As someone who is an independent, who says, I'm looking at the landscape, and all I want to do is beat Trump, because I think Trump is worse than everything. I think the White Walkers are the worst thing there can possibly be. And anybody who can be an ally to me against the White Walkers is an advantage. The other example I would give is nukes. Like, nobody wants nukes, mm -hmm. right? But we don't want the Koreans to have our nukes, North mm -hmm. Koreans to have our nukes. Right. And sometimes you have nukes in part as a deterrent. So I look at Bloomberg on this battlefield as a guy who can bring resources, who can bring guns to the most important fight of our time. Yeah. Um, I want, how do you see it? Here's how, please, and, and talk about your thoughts, please, on, on Bloomberg, because your voice has been really important in this discussion as he continues to ascend. He's third in the national polls now. Here's how right. Michael Bloomberg would have been most useful in all of this. Michael Bloomberg, who is wealthy, by the way, I, don't th I think in, in a way that I don't think most people quite understand. Michael, Michael Bloomberg has around $58 billion. So just... Try to wrap your mind around what that is, yeah. if you're listening. So, you know, that is, that is like several, you know, trips around the earth more than Trump, <laughs> right. okay? Right, right. <laughs> okay? Right. Um, so we're, um, you know, th this is a, a guy that's wealthy beyond 
all kinds of conception. Here's how he would have been useful. He would have been useful if he hadn't run for president and used his money to help fund campaigns, not simply of other people running for president, but help felons in Florida gain their right to vote through Amendment 4. Those folks in Florida have to pay their fines by law. It was ruled. Uh, they have to pay fines that they owe on uh, their judgments, uh, you know, on their, so that in, in order to regain their right to vote. Uh, essentially, it's really a de facto poll tax. I don't, it, whether it was a mistake written into the law or it's a bad judgment, they have to pay what's owed on their judgment in order to regain their, their right to vote, even though Amendment 4 was passed overwhelmingly by the people of Florida. Bipartisan. Yeah, but he's got enough money to do both, Jamil. I like, know. Right? Like, he doesn't have to. Right. Like, he, 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 oh. if, he, if he goes down and focuses on that, that's great. Right. I think it's important. But, I don't mean but to dismiss here's, it. But here's the problem. Yeah. If he does both, it's, it looks like it's doing it for him. Because if he, yeah. but if he, if he, if he pays, if he pays the, if he pays it, if he pays it, he looks. I mean, he's running I for president. I understand what he's you're like. He's from. like he's paying it. He's, he's like, but hey guys, is... I did this, and I'm like, I'm expecting you yeah. basically to vote for me. Do you, I don't know if you, you can't really I don't know do that as a candidate. You're a journalist, and you've been obviously advocating for many of the positions on on the political left. Are you a Democrat, or how do you identify yourself? I mean, look, I I, I have in the past registered as a Democrat when I lived in New York because I needed to vote in, in the primary. Right, right. You know, yeah. And so I don't look at myself as a Democrat per se, because yeah. I, listen, I, when people ask me, like, oh, do you have a candidate in the race? And I say, my answer always is, um, I'm not rooting for any of these people. Uh, my job is a journal, is, as a journalist is to push these people to be better. Right. Um, right. I need to, and I've told them, most of them, to their faces. I've had uh, either on the record or off the record sessions with um, m m m most of them. I, no, I wouldn't say most of them. Um, I can tell you uh, Warren, Buttigieg, Har Harris, um, Booker, um, just off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. And I've told every one of them to their faces, um, look, I'm not rooting for you. Um, my, my job is to push you to be a better candidate uh, mm. in whatever way that, that manifests itself. Mm. And I would tell every one of them to their faces the same thing. And I, I, I you know, my, my estimation is I would speak to any candidate um, running for anything, probably except Trump, because um, I don't waste my time with people who would lie to me. I want to come. I want to come back to that, right? Because the reason I ask is that there is this massive ripping apart of the Democratic Party that's happening right now. Yeah. Right? And you're a thought leader. You're in a place where you can influence the discussion. You can get people to think about things differently. You can galvanize support, right? People read your column and they think differently about someone like Bloomberg, and maybe they take their money or their time and and go elsewhere. But there's a part of this that that has a strategic element that I feel like the Democrats, and I'm using that broadly, are missing, right? Like a lot of things people would like Bloomberg to do. You know what he could also do is sit home and do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is a serious risk, right? For a long time, the right has had people like Sheldon Adelson. They've had billionaires yeah. that have created Fox News and massive machines. And what I think Bloomberg is doing is building a machine, right? He's gonna be, he is building a machine. And now that we come out of New Hampshire, you see which machines matter. Buttigieg built a machine. It's a small machine that's rising. Maybe he's Tesla, okay? <laughs> but it's but it's it's coming, yeah. right? And it's growing. And we'll see how far it goes, right? Whether or not they can, you know, create the solution to all uh, combustion <laughs> vehicles or not, we'll see. Right. And then you got, you know, um, Bernie, who's like, I don't know what Toyota or something. Like he's just <laughs> he just keeps churning and, and and chugging out. But you've got Bloomberg, who's coming in and offering to hand multiple vehicle lines to whoever is picked, right. right? I think the reality is that he won't get the nomination, right? Mm -hmm. But he will influence the nomination, and it, it may end up being Sanders, or let's say it's Sanders or, 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 or Biden, right? Or mm -hmm. Buttigieg, any of the three. Right. And he has thousands of people. He hired 2,000 people, I think, in the last month, people who now have retirement accounts and have good pay and health benefits, and they're sure they can be in the fight until December. So he's got his own army, right? Mm -hmm. And he is going to hand that to somebody. Right. Right. And, and let them drive because they're going to be the candidate. Right. And at the same time, he's going to do some asymmetric warfare on the side and the dragon, you know, might go higher, might go lower. And maybe he'll bring another dragon in. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. why does the strategic imperative, in my view, 
get lost? Is that part of the primary process? Is it like people want him to be better? I get that. But at the same time, the stakes are so fucking high. If Trump wins, all the issues you care about are gone. Right. All the issues that so many people in the Democratic Party care about are gone. They're not even on the table. They're going backwards. So to some extent, I've been very critical of the Democrats eating their own. Right. And it feels like a moment where the Democrats are continuing to eat their own and continue to spend resources on each other and, and a lot of ink in places instead of focusing on how to coalesce in whatever way possible around the common enemy. I think there's two problems that are existing right now. One is that I think too many people are getting wrapped up in this cult of personality around their particular candidates. Yeah. I think people are getting so wrapped up in hey, I really love my particular guy or lady that I'm really invested in. And I think for certain candidates, it's been a healthier thing than others. Um, I think the Warren folks you've seen in polls, they are very willing, if Warren goes by the wayside, they are very willing to hop on with someone else. I, and I think that's, a, frankly, a reflection of the mentality of the candidate. You've seen in the in the recent time interview with Charlotte Alter, she says, look, I am more focused on getting my policies accomplished, my policies right. in, you know, put into reality than me being elected president. If, 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 if Pete Buttigieg or Bernie Sanders were elected and they adopted my policies and got them done, hey, I'm great. Right. That's cool. Great. I don't see Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg saying the same things. I need to hear, I need to hear them saying that. I need, I need to hear it. So I, I hear you on that. And, and the you know one, what I mean? I, I, or Mike I, Bloomberg, frankly, saying that. Yeah, I'm, Mike Bloomberg, I think he's, again, I, I, I appreciate the resources that he brings to the fight. I think Bloomberg, like everyone else, is flawed. I think your point about the cult of personality, Jamil, is really important because everybody loved Andrew Yang. Yeah. Not everybody's going to vote for him. Andrew Yang's gone. Right. Right. Andrew Yang was rocking. He was on every news show. But you need a machine. Right. You need a successful business. Right. You can't just have like there's plenty of people who are like this is a really cool T-shirt. Great. And then that 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 brand is out of business because it's not a sustainable business model. Right. right. So I think that's what we're seeing with Andrew Yang. Right. Where Andrew Yang is going to be something. He's going to be around. I hope he runs for mayor of New York. I think he's going to have a long career. But keeping a ground game keeping ads up, keeping people on payroll, mm -hmm. paying for health benefits right. is expensive and hard, so you got to have a machine, and I think that's what we're seeing now. The machines are starting, the wheels are coming off on some of them, mm -hmm. and they just fall right off the map, and others are, are chugging along, and some of them are going to need a fuel injection, right? We'll see if, if what happens to Biden in South Carolina, we'll see what happens in Nevada, and this could change pretty quickly, right. but Demo there's you know the old saying that, um, that Democrats fall in love and Republicans fall in line. While we're talking about mm -hmm. all this, Trump is just stacking money up. Right. He's stacking money, he's stacking surrogates, he's stacking ground game. I mean, and, and the fight is coming. So at what point, is there a point where the Democrats get together? Well, and, and when you say that, I want to ask you this. I don't think Bernie's going to do it. I think Bernie's going to push all the way through, maybe through the convention. And you see it more and more. There's a resistance that if Bernie loses... I don't think Bernie's people are going to be as cool with this as everybody else's. That's that's my assessment. Mm -hmm. And seeing the friction flying at me on Twitter and everywhere else, I don't think that his people are just going to say, "Okay, great, Biden," or "Okay, great, Buttigieg," because yeah. he is an ideologue, and and he is not willing to compromise his ideals, which is respectable on some levels, yeah. but not practical on another. What concerns me, and it gets to my second point. What concerns me is that what it, is that folks are not really keeping their eye on the prize. And that is because too many folks do not have skin in the game. Or they don't think that they have skin in the game. Right. Like, Trump's presidency, <laughs> okay, I think is a really interesting experiment, a social experiment. I think it has actually acquainted all of America to, a, to, a varying, to varying levels with the experience of marginalized people. Now... We are in this election. Even we're actually a lot of folks are getting the experience of you know having to be pragmatic about their vote. Right. You know, um, this is the experience that Black voters have every single election. Mm. <laughs> every election, we have to do this. Mm. We have to be pragmatic about our vote. We are, we often have to vote uh, for who we are you know either forced to vote for or you know are left with our, right. our best worst choice um, as as we often have are put. And a lot of uh, folks who are not black are now faced with uh, this decision. And so welcome to it.
Mm -hmm. This isn't what it feels like. Um, being living in, in America under Trump um, is a, a you know a, 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 a you know a bottle of you know I guess stress and, <laughs> and anxiety <laughs> yeah. um, that uh, acquaints you. I think um, at, a, 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 at a very small level. Uh, with what it is like to be a marginalized, uh, you know, minority, uh, to use a word that I actually hate, but I think pe people will understand it better, a marginalized minority in this country. Yeah. Um, welcome to it. Yeah. And I think that people need to take that experience into the ballot box with them. Understand what it is, you know, you, you remember what it's like to feel that way. Uh, and understand how much it sucks and remember how, mu how much you hate feeling like that. Uh, remember how distasteful and painful and scary it is and understand that there are those of us who have felt that way every single day of our lives uh, and there's some of us, you know, and I see this as a black person who grew up in the suburbs, more privileged than a lot of other black people who are suffering a lot more than I am today. You need to understand that there are folks who are going to suffer a lot more if this man is reelected. And you need to get over yourself and realize that voting is a selfless act. And you need to realize that it is not about you. It is not about your candidate. It is not about who you fall in love with or your particular movement. It is about making a choice to put this country on one path or the other, mm. period. Mm. And look, I put it at the end of my column yesterday. A primary is about making a decision about a nominee. This is what a primary is for. You are trying to decide who is going to be best for representing your party uh, and who is best going to best govern as president. That is another thing we need to also, you know, with regards to Sanders, that I'm concerned about. How are you, like, th whether or not he is going to be a good governor. Um, yeah. Okay. Just a, a quick note on that. But, you know, I need to, um, you know, really stress to folks th that this is a, a, a choice. We are, we, are, we are the HR for this country. Okay. It's a, it's a job search. Okay. It is not. It's not that it's not much deeper than that. OK, mm. it's not about the soul of our nation mm. or any of that other bullshit. Mm. OK, mm. it's a job search. OK, we are hiring someone. OK, for a job. Look at it like that. Mm. Period. End of story. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now we drink. This is why it helps to have liquor on this show. <laughs> you, you ain't <laughs> right? lying. I you actually weren't going to do the beer. On you, you. You were like, you know, I got to drive afterward. I said, no, we're I'm gonna, over we're, here, Mr. I Responsible. Said, we're going to get into some stuff, <laughs> so we're going to need to have a drink from time to time because that's where real political conversations happen is with a beer or with a drink or, you know, not in – a cable news box, right? Yeah. And, and that's one of the many reasons why I was happy to have you come on this show because, look, war and conflict is not an issue you can jam into a two-minute soundbite. And I've been trying to do it for decades. Yeah. And race isn't either. Yeah. And, and you've been on that, that front as well. Yeah, and, and, it, it, and, it, and it, it, neither is gender, which I wrote yeah, about in this essay in, so this, much in this book that just came so out. So much of it, yeah. uh, Believe me, um, How Trusting Women Can Change the World, uh, this anthology. I just came, uh, had an essay in uh, with uh, Jessica Valenti and Jacqueline Friedman, hmm. uh, who were the editors. I uh, have an essay in it called uh, She Can't Breathe, which is, about, which is, of course, a play on words uh, from uh, Eric Garner's uh, right. final words. Uh, which is about black women. When and, he was, for and, folks who may not know the reference, when he was choked out by the police, he said, I can't breathe. Exactly. Said, can't and, breathe. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, Anu Bakwadi, you know, who founded yeah. Swan, who has an essay in the, in the book. Um, and it's the book's really just full of essays uh, of women and men. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Ayanna Presley has an essay in the book as well. It's all uh, really just about uh, ending rape, man. And uh, it, it, that's, it's some heavy stuff, but it's, yeah. worth, it's worth taking a look at. Yeah. So when you think, Jamil, when you, when you think about the, the last exchange we had where you talked about it, we're picking a person for a job, right? At the end of the day, you're, you're a student of history. You're a student of culture. Who do you think is the best person to beat Trump? Uh, it's tough. All the other stuff aside, right? We're just talking. You used to cover football. Yeah. Right? You used to, and I want to get into that, of course, right? We got to talk football. Oh, we got to talk football. <laughs> but, but you used to cover football. You used to write about football. You know, this is the Super Bowl. Right, I don't know who you picked in, in the game with the Chiefs versus the Niners, but this is a game. You got to make a pick. 
who do you think is 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 the best quarterback to go up against? You know, this is not even. I don't want to disrespect the New England Patriots, which you're going up against here. But like this is this is the, this is the monster, right? Mm-hmm. And you got to give the ball to somebody, and you care deeply on a personal level. You care deeply on a moral issue uh, level. Who who's the quarterback you're throwing in there? It's funny that you mentioned the Patriots because I'm picking the person that represents a part of New England. It's Elizabeth Warren. I mean, to me, she is not only – You think she can win? Yeah, I think she can win. Even I mean, now where the questions are she and Biden may fall out in the next couple of weeks. I mean, first of all, the column I wrote today, we're talking on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, everybody needs to slow the hell down. I mean, we've had two contests in two small states – that are more than 90% white. Like, a whole swaths of this country that have, you know, m- pretty much most of the black and indigenous and Hispanic and Latino and Asian <laughs> folks have not had a chance to even vote yet. They haven't even had a chance to meet these people. Yeah. Like, but do we have to slow, slow the down? hell down, like, man? Can we afford to slow down when candidates are dropping out? Sure. And and, and we we obviously. I wish Andrew Yang hadn't dropped out. Yeah. I wish I wish but Kamala they, Harris hadn't dropped out. How do they, how do they balance that though, right? Because we're saying, hey, don't drop we out. We need a new but, system. But, but, but they have to pay the bills, right? Yeah. And and that's the question is like the system is broken. The system Iowa is broken. Not, Iowa should not be first. New Hampshire should not be up front. But in the in in the meantime, they are. Yeah. So the question I have with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie, if Elizabeth Warren was moderate, Elizabeth Warren. Which sometimes you hear. Mm-hmm. There was a point early in the campaign where she sounded a lot more populist. Mm-hmm. She sounded a lot more moderate, and then she, I think, has weaved a little bit and gone a little bit toward Bernie. So where does she sit in the landscape? I don't know. I think I will tell you that the moderates, in my view, and the progressives are more. The, the moderates are more likely to roll, rally around Warren than they are around Sanders. If the Democrats pick Sanders, that party's going to get ripped apart. Yeah. If if they don't pick Sanders, it's probably also going to get ripped apart. Mm-hmm. So I feel like between the progressives, Warren has a better chance to unite the tribes. But but I don't know, man. I don't know if she's going to get moderate Republicans. I don't know if she's going to get people in the middle. I don't know if she's going to get independents. I think she's going to get the Democrats. Mm-hmm. She'll bring energy. She's incredibly dynamic. I think she's the fastest learner of all the candidates. She learns so quickly on anything that's happening and is able to spit it out. Yeah. But to our point earlier, it doesn't look like she can build a machine. The machine's out of gas. Or it's close to it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it seems like there's money issues. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I saw them. They were pulling ads in the next two states, Nevada and South Carolina. I saw that, uh, you know, <laughs> that's obviously an issue. So, listen, I, I can't speak to the mechanics of the campaign. Right. I'm speaking to the candidate and whether or not she would be you know, able to take on Trump if she were the nominee and whether or not she would govern well as president. Um, You know, to me, I think she would be uh, the best. I think she'd be the best person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that I would be the most confident in her abilities Mm -hmm. to uh, to get the job done. Having been around almost all of them and I've been in rooms and been in meetings with most of them, I would trust Elizabeth Warren much more so to run the government to yes. be an executive, to get shit done. She's shown she could do that, yeah. right? The Consumer Protection Board was not a thing. She built it. She drove it. She ran it. She was a great advocate. You know, in, in many ways, in, you know, we both spent a lot of time in New York City. In New York City, you have the public advocate, yeah. which is kind of like the hellraiser in chief, right? Yep. Like you advocate for people in the same way I have and you have in our, in our careers and in our lives. And that's where de Blasio came from. It's where a lot of folks right. have come from. She was kind of a public advocate for the country, and now she's able, I think, to effectively transition into an executive role, much more so than the other progressive, the much more progressive in, in Bernie Sanders. So yeah. I, I think that does give me, at least me, a feeling that if she had her hands on the wheel, she could handle it. Yeah. Right. I don't have that kind of confidence in, in Bernie Sanders. Yeah. I saw him struggle to run the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. You know, all the talk about bringing people together. Mm. He couldn't do it in the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. Yeah. And on a very important point, I brought this up in previous podcasts, when it came down to it, he went into room to negotiate his positions and he lost. When he went in to do the, 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 the bill for veterans after Phoenix, yeah. he went into the room with John McCain and John McCain got the biggest expansion of privatization in the VA in history. Yeah. Bernie gave away his own farm. He opened the door. He allowed them to privatize the VA, and he lost. And a, and a senior Republican senator told me, we sent in John McCain because we know he'd win. 
We knew he'd win. We knew he'd beat Bernie and he could get Bernie and that we would walk out with the win. And they walked out with the win. So that's what worries me wow. about Bernie. Wow. But, but let's take a bigger step back. Um, this is Angry Americans. Yeah. And, and a <laughs> lot of folks have had a lot to say about the title Ooh. of this show. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, there's only, I've said this before, there's only really? one group of people, like if I was going to do some polling around, you know, the demographics of, of voters, there's only one kind of people that have consistently had a problem with the name, and it tends to be huh. liberal white men. Right? Oh, Cause imagine that. Because they're kind of uncomfortable with their own anger, and I don't know if I'm <laughs> allowed to be angry, and like, what do we do with that, right? And maybe some moderate, older, what, but everybody else is angry. I bet they're mad right? that Joker lost Best Picture, too. Maybe, but yeah. like everybody's <laughs> angry. Okay. But in particular, I think everybody has a right to be angry. Yeah. Right? And, and, and uh, communities of color in particular, I think, have a right to be angry. And hopefully we can all turn that anger into you know, positive impact. That's a theme of this show. But... It, it is it is a very important time, I think, to understand anger. Yeah. Because Trump understands it. Yeah. And he's channeled it in a lot of ways. And that's what Bernie does. Bernie's channeling anger, right, in, in a lot of ways. But you are a, a, an incredible guest for this moment in time. Jameel Smith, what makes you angry? What makes me angry are people who pimp anger. People who take anger and channel it for their own profit. Those are people, that, though, that's what makes me angry. And I think I've seen that, you know, that I think people who do that make our world cynical. Um, they exploit our processes and mechanics and they, they are actually, what, they're the people who clog up the works. Mm. Um, cause look, we got enough wrong with America. We got enough, uh, holes in the boat, as I like to say. Mm. Um, Trump is a guy who not only knows how to exploit anger, but he knows where the holes in the boat are mm. and he knows how to create more holes. He got into office and he knows where the holes in the boat are. It's like he knew where every hole in America's boat was. Mm -hmm. You know, and rather than working to plug the holes, like a responsible president, like like no American president is gonna know is gonna be able to plug every hole. You know, you mentioned Obama with the VA, like it's just like he's not, you know, Gitmo. He's just he's not he's gonna try, right? And there's gonna be people working against him trying to prevent him to you know from plugging those holes, but he's gonna try to plug as many holes as he can, you know, because. That's what actually, you know, actual public servants do. Mm. This guy is out here, you know, with a, with a power drill. Right. You know, <laughs> right. trying to create more holes yeah. and inviting other, other of his, you know, friends from overseas to help him, you know, make more holes mm -hmm. and trying to help him, you know, sink the boat even further. Mm. Um, Thank you for that. That, to me... Um, I mean, you know, people are like, oh, he's a Russian agent. Uh, you know, I don't care where he's an agent from. Um, the guy is an enemy of the state, period. And uh, you have a, you know, someone in office who is working against the interests of the United States. And every day we go without the people who are running to replace him not repeating that ad nauseum, um, I, I, I don't understand it. I, I, for the life of me, you know, you, you have, you know, you haven't, you know, the guy in office basically complaining that his criminal conspiracy buddy is, you know, is getting too harsh a sentence. He goes and tells, uh, the, you know, complains loudly about that to the DOJ and, you know, his lackey in running the DOJ goes and gives him a lighter sentence. Mm. I mean, we, not that long ago, people were having conniption fit about Bill Clinton and, you know, Loretta Lynch on a plane. And now this happens and everyone's just, you know, going home and watching Sports Center and acting like nothing's nothing's wrong. Mm. I, yeah. I, that that to me is a sign that the cynicism has bled so deeply into our into our culture and beneath our skins that, um, you know, I just frankly don't know how um, we fix that. And I think that is how uh that's how he wins this uh election it's not 
it's it's not even. I mean, look, there's going to be voter suppression and then all, all kinds of the things that that work against the Democrats. Um, but you know, it, it's 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 less about who who they pick, but it, it's more about the cultural issues that they're ne- that they're never going to be able to fix before November. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. And you you mentioned Sports Center. <laughs> oh yeah. We talked about uh, Russian agents, but there's a different kind of free agent, <laughs> a free agent that I want to talk to you about Uh-oh. because. You know, he has picked these holes in the boat to focus on. Mm. And for a long time, one of them was football mm. and the NFL yeah. and, and Kaepernick. And we just finished a Super Bowl where Kaepernick's former team was in the game and hardly talked about it. Nobody talked about it. Yeah. Um, you know, Kaepernick was maybe one of the most, uh, 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 let's see, effective lightning rods. Yeah. Right. In a lot of different ways. Yeah. Right. And, and something that Trump hit on a lot. Right. He hit on a lot because he knew it was a hole that he could open up. Right? Yeah. He can open that hole deeper. But here here we sit. You, you Your background was working at NFL Films. You worked on. Didn't you work on Hard Knocks? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, I was yeah. an associate producer. Uh, you know, one of the best shows anywhere. Yeah. But um, what are your thoughts on now where we sit on this? Right. Like mm-hmm. we covered a lot of stuff. The po- most political Super Bowl we've ever seen with the ads and the pregame interview with Hannity. But we didn't really unpack the the Kaepernick thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so I hate to even say, call it that, but all of the stuff around it. Mm-hmm. Here we sit later. Um, where are we, right? And, and, and what are your reflections on, on the Super Bowl and this moment from a cultural standpoint? And I also want to ask you, because it's somewhat related in my view, um, Kobe's passing mm. is a massive cultural moment. Yeah. And and I want to get your thoughts on that, but maybe you know Kaepernick and football. First. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get to I'll get to Kaepernick first. So yeah, I mean obviously, I mean he was pretty well erased um, by the NFL. I mean I did see they replayed uh, his Super Bowl uh, that he played against Baltimore. I mean yeah. people uh, people seem to forget the last time that the 49ers were in the Super Bowl, Kaepernick was the quarterback. Oh yeah, I was at that game. Yo, I, I was at that game in New Orleans. The light lights went out. Yeah. I kept saying, you have Frank Gore, give him the fucking ball. You're on the four-yard line. And yeah, people right? forget, like, if the yeah, lights yeah, hadn't yeah. gone out, yeah. I would I argue that if the lights hadn't <laughs> gone out, San Francisco probably wins the game. Yeah. Um, well, if they had given the ball to Frank Gore, they definitely would have won the game. Well, yeah. yeah. And ironically, they end up losing a Super Bowl again for not running the ball. I mean, ball. you're kind of blaming Kaepernick <laughs> for losing the game. No, I'm not. I'm blaming, I'm blaming, I'm blaming, the, I'm blaming the coaching staff. No, that's true. Right? Because you're true. on the four-yard line. Like, you got Frank Gore. Like, Kaepernick was still in, what, second, third year at the time, right? Yeah. It was a question of whether or not he was going to be better than Russell Wilson or not. There was always a debate right yeah about who, right yeah and now russell wilson's a perennial pro bowler yeah but but sorry just missed that throw it's yeah. just mm. but yeah and uh so you know kaepernick's the quarterback and the last time the 49ers go uh and then you know they go again and what's happened well the nfl's inspire change brand uh their little social justice label uh they have a six-part miniseries uh featuring nate boyer uh, you know, the, the Green Beret veteran uh, who was Kaepernick's teammate, who was, you know, the, the, the white guy who inspired uh, or basically directed Kaepernick to instead of sitting on the bench during the anthem uh, to instead take a knee. Uh, and so Nate was, you know, hired, I guess, to host a six part miniseries. Now, you know, no shade to Nate, you know, God bless him. But. I mean, that Everybody is loves how, veterans, man. Right. It's the perfect political tool. I say it all the time. Babies, puppies, and vets. You don't <laughs> want people to talk about Kaepernick? Find a vet. All right. Here's, you know, again, no shade on, on Nate. Right. But, but I also argue that Nate gave him bad advice. Like, you know, I don't know what made Nate, you know, the, the, the arbiter of all things, you know, political activism. But if Kaepernick had came to me, I wouldn't have told him to kneel. I would have said, we can come up with some more creative shit than that. Or, and some stuff that might not divide your base. And also, if he had just <laughs> stayed on the bench, maybe he, it wouldn't have been like a big, as big a deal. <laughs> yeah. Or he could have taken a knee on the first play of the game. There's right. a lot. Of, I mean, again, I'm not one to, to I think the, the movement is important. The issues are important. But it's not lost on the fact that, like, Kaepernick says he chose it because you said directed. Yeah. Right. Your your choice of words was well, that Nate Booyer directed him. Well, I mean, it was recommended. He recommended to 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 Cap that he that he take a knee. Yeah. It wasn't that he like you know told him to do it. Yeah, but the yeah, point is yeah. is that he he recommended that he take the knee. Right. And the point is is that the NFL instead of mentioning Kaepernick's name even once or even showing some clips of the uh, the former game. I mean, I watched the whole game. They didn't show any clips of the of the past game. How ridiculous is that? Like they didn't even yeah. show any clips of the last game that the 49ers were in. And 
instead of that, they have a six-part miniseries with the guy who told <laughs> Cap that taking a knee was yeah. a good idea. I mean, they erased it. Come him. on, guys. They, they erased like, Kaepernick. I mean, at, at some point, you know, you're blackballing a player from the league. You know, at some point, you know, you just got to own it. Right. You know, just own it. Just saying we're blackballing the guy for – you know, for protesting for his civil rights. And we're doing it because we're scared of our white racist fans. Yeah. Just own it, man. And, and the white racist president, right? Like, mm. they, they erased Kaepernick well, from Yeah, I'm grouping so, Trump in yeah, with the white but racist But especially fans. him. Because, Pence, because if, be the, if, there was, if there was an election between the NFL and, and Trump, yeah. right? Like, Trump was kicking his ass. I met with Roger Goodell during that time period. Mm. He actually invited me in to talk about the polling we had really? done around. Oh, yeah, it was... We'll do a whole maybe separate podcast on that. Ooh. But they said, you know, we're trying to understand what veterans think and what's really going on here. And unfortunately, you know, the way they had been getting data, it was like the equivalent of like going into Iowa and finding one dude outside a pancake house and saying, hey, what do Iowans think about X? That's basically what the NFL did with, with Nate Booyer, right? There wasn't any extensive polling. They didn't do a strategic process. They didn't bring in Colin Powell and Admiral Mullen and cultural experts like you or me or anyone else, right? Yeah. Like, it just kind of ran away, and Trump saw it, and Trump just kept pounding it and pounding it and pounding it. And the NFL really didn't have a strategy. Like, they really didn't know what to do except to try to ignore him, but ignoring Trump doesn't really work. So, you know, I think he beat them up pretty good. And then what they did was kept, kept their head down and hoped that he'd pick another target. Mm. And that's what he did. Like, then he picked AOC, and then he picked Nancy Pelosi, and then he had an MP, there are plenty of other things. Yeah. But he's always got that card he can pull back. But he won. The NFL, you know, nobody kneels in the NFL anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, it didn't happen in the Super Bowl. There wasn't a single player that I saw kneeling, no. right? No. So you could argue, at least on that battle space politically, Trump won. I mean... Here's the thing. They did donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to social justice causes. Uh, you With a billion dollar market cap. So that's like, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, believe me, I'm yeah. not on the side of the thing, you know, <laughs> arguing that they won. Yeah. Uh, there are players who arguably elicited some concessions from the league out of this. It's not like they got nothing. No. But. They sure didn't get much. It was they, like didn't, they didn't get enough. It's like sending Bernie Sanders in to negotiate. They didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I so, thought I was going to be the Bernie critic on this show. <laughs> no, man. I haven't gotten started yet on Bernie. But um, we, we're going through some heavy stuff. But I, I also want every guest that we have on this show, Jamil, is an inspiring, important, and or iconic American. I think you have been on, on the forefront of many of the most important issues of our time, right? And you've been... Mm -hmm. You were we first met, I think, when you were producer for Rachel. Yeah, for Rachel Maddow. Like that was yeah. back a decade ago now. Literally, oh my god. Yeah, right. Yeah, literally, 2010. I uh, started in the summer of 2010 as a producer for Rachel Maddow show. And you've been a producer. You've been a writer. You've been front of camera. You've been back of camera. Yeah. So you know you've been in the mix for for 20 years, right? I mean, yeah. at least. Yeah. Um. So I w I want to ask you, you know, what's that like for you? Personally, right? Because I think yeah. uh, part of what I want to do in this show is help people understand the people they think they know. Megan mm. McCain was on last episode, and people felt like they actually understood her in a way they didn't before. They said that about Tulsi. They said that about Mayor Pete Buttigieg, about a lot of the, the guests we've had on the show. Because I want it to be a conversation, not just a, uh, an interview. Right. But, right. but you know, it's got to be kind of surreal for you, man. I mean, it's surreal. I, I just did a television hit, and every single time I do him, it feels awkward uh because i was behind the camera producing for so long that every single time i'm asked to do one of those things it just feels strange um i think that there's a point where i'm asked for either my opinion or to talk about things um where i i know that i i feel like i'm volunteering my my opinion and it's a learned opinion about something where i i feel like it's valuable and I, I, I do this because I feel like I have something to contribute. And that's always why I wanted to do this. And it's why I was writing for the Mattel blog while I was producing for her. You know, I was, I was trying to, like, you know, you know, wet my, wet my whistle a little bit, I guess you could say, with yeah. regards to this. But I, I just always was, I was always learning at her feet um, the entire time. I mean, I always carry the maxim that Rachel preached while I was her producer with me every single day, which is increase the amount of useful information in the world. Mm. That's what she taught. 
And I think about that every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not doing that with my work, with uh, being on air, uh, with a tweet even, uh, look, I have fun with tweets or an Instagram post or something. <laughs> look, I, you can't take everything so seriously. Yeah. But, you know, overall, you got to be increasing the amount of useful information in the world, right. especially in your professional capacity. Mm -hmm. And I just, I take this seriously. I just do, man. Uh, yeah. I, I work too hard to get to where I'm at. Um, I, you know, I'm a kid from Cleveland, man, who, who had no connections. In New York City, I was, um, I, I started, at, you know, as a floater, a talent agency out of college. And, you know, William Morris was like four years of, you know, inter media, I guess you could say graduate school, in media yeah. entertainment graduate school. You know, I learned at the feet of talent agents um, in all kinds of different fields. Um, I met some amazing and incredible people, um, but all of them, I'd say for the most part, we're doing things I just didn't want to do. Hmm. Um, and I, I still value a lot of those people. One of them is, you know, who I was answering his phones, you know, 20 years ago is now my agent, you know, got, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> that's cool. So the guy whose desk you worked on is now your agent. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And, um, I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, in terms of like talking about things coming full circle. Yeah. A lot of that knowledge that I gained in that time period, you know, I still use today, mm. you know, and and I feel like I just tell people all the time, you know, especially if they're coming up, they're young. Look, you may have a lot of passions. You know, I thought about being a filmmaker. I wanted to, uh, journalism was always a calling, but, you know, so was making films. So was writing. So was there's so many different things. I I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I felt like I was being pulled in so many different directions. Mm. And I figured at just one point I just figured the hell with it, man. I'm just gonna do all of them, <laughs> and I'm just gonna do yeah. one at a you know maybe sometimes I was doing one at a time, or just kind of you know I was HBO doing you know learning you know sports production, um, and you know CNN I was learning news production, um, NFL films I was kind of doing you know a little bit of, you know a little bit of all of them, um, MSNBC kind of a little bit of all of them, but. You know, and I eventually, uh, you know, got to a point when I was working for Melissa Harris Perry for three years doing this amazing, incredible news product that, frankly, I just, I, there's just, I don't think there's ever been a show on television like it, and there hasn't been one since. Mm. Um, I'm so, I'm still so proud of what we did with that. But it came a point in time, you know, Melissa and I sat down in her office where I just, you know, I told her, you know, I, I, I got to move on. And she, she knew, she knew. Yeah. And, um, and I started taking steps to, to move on and I had to write full time. Mm. And that was, that, that just, and that was it. And that was that. Mm. And I went on a new Republic and I've been writing full time ever since. And, and, you, and you write a lot. Like I, the, you told, like I, I think you did two pieces or three pieces. Two this pieces week. in the last day. Yeah, <laughs> two and days. I was like holy shit, I can't even keep up with how much you're writing, which is important because I think you are carrying forward that message that Rachel brings out. That I think whether you agree with her politics or not, no matter where you come from, you can appreciate that there is a part of her that wants to be the instructor to the country, the professor at yeah. a time where you need more information. And now you can see all of her students going on to do great things. But I want to, Jimmy, I'll go back to a question. Uh, that I ask of all guests. You mentioned growing up in Cleveland. Yes. When you were growing up in, in Cleveland, or if it was somewhere else, what was your first car? Uh, I was born and raised in Cleveland. Uh, grew up mostly in a suburb called Shaker Heights, uh, which uh, people read the uh, wonderful book, uh, Little Fires Everywhere. Uh, that's where I grew up. Um, my first car, I actually didn't get until I moved. Uh, I lived in New York for about seven years after college, and uh, I moved to Philly to take the NFL Films job. It was uh, the very first day, uh, I got, it was uh, August 31st of 04, I got to uh, Philly and um, quickly, very quickly, got to a Honda dealership and um, picked up a blue 2004 Honda Civic LX. And um, that was the first car I ever owned. And the next day I drove it to NFL Films for my first day and walked in and Steve Sable was the very first... Uh, person I saw as I walked in I'm wearing a tie like I am now 
Uh, and that is not really how you do it at NFL Films. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he playfully, uh, um, you know, God rest his soul, um, made fun of me for wearing a tie. Mm. And um, then, but the, f- the fun story about the car is that on my very first day at NFL Films, I got a flat tire. Ah, coming out of the parking lot. <laughs> what what color was the car, Jimmy? Um, it was like a. Like you le- said it was a blue. What kind yeah, of blue? It was like kind of like um, like a coral blue, like like kind of an electric blue. Ah, and I had it. Um, I had it for about eight years. Steve and Steve Sable was a, a an icon. Yeah. Right. I mean, anybody who grew up in the last generation watching NFL films, the great storytelling of, mm-hmm. of Steve Sable. Steve Sable, right? I mean, he he. he built a lot of the NFL brand yeah. that we know, right? Mm-hmm. What Did you learn anything else? Did you learn anything from working near him or around him? Oh, my gosh. I think it's valuable. Well, Steve Sable, um, by the way, who was just um, now in, inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Right. Um, and will be, uh, I'm sorry, he was just chosen uh, to be in, into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He'll be inducted uh, later this year. Um, Steve was with apologies to Rachel, very, who was very close <laughs> in, this, in this standing, uh, the best boss I've ever had. Mm. Um, he was extraordinarily kind, but uh, demanding in a, in a way that you knew his standards, but he was never going to make you feel as if you had failed him in a way that you could never recover. Mm. Um, I never felt like I had ever disappointed him in a way that, uh, you know, ever, you know, made me feel lesser, you know, in his eyes. He always made me feel like I was as equal on the team as the top producers in the building. Mm. Guys had been in there 30 years. Yeah. Um, guys who were, you know, you'd seen in footage, you know, from, you know, old Super Bowls. Um which made me feel great. Mm. Um, I tell you one quick Steve Sable story. Um, aside from, well, actually two quick ones. One is when I first uh, brought my dad in the building, you know, to take him around in the tour. My dad, who introduced me to the game, you know, was in, you know, was at the 1964 championship game at, at age 18 to see Jim Brown play, wow. um, and was just had his eyes bugged out the entire time walking around the building, I take him around to meet Steve Sable. He, Steve welcomes him into his office and talk, starts talking about how, what a great writer I am. And I, you know, my dad is just bursting with pride and, you know, still talks about it to this day. Um, That's awesome. But my big Steve Sable memory is um, every, every team, every one of the 32 teams in the NFL gets their own highlight film. And it's the only thing that teams get their final cut on. Uh, and so my first highlight film that I ever cut was for the then St. Louis Rams hmm. in 05. And, it, you know, then they had hired a new coach, Scott Linehan. Um, and so it was like a new coach, new approach film. So I'd gone down to St. Louis, uh, filmed a rookie camp where we'd put a wire on Linehan. So we had some footage of Linehan directing rookie camp. Um, and then I'd done an interview with him. So we had some good material for the film because the team, obviously, they'd had a new coach. They hadn't done that well the previous season. So we had to fill, you know, some time. And I, you know, I made the film and I, you know, we'd had the final cut of the film and I put it on a mini DV and I'd had the tape and I put, I was about to put it on Steve's desk and he happened to be in his office and knock on the door. I say, Steve, you know, I have um, my highlight film here. I would love if you just take a look at it give me some notes um, whenever you get a chance. And I was prepared to just leave it on his desk. And he said, well, what are you doing? I, oh, I was like, what do you mean? Oh, I, 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 I thought he was asking me, like, what was I doing? Like, leaving it on it. Yeah. I, I said, oh, no. He said, no, what are you doing right now? I, I, well, I'm, I, I'm not busy. Uh, he said, well, let's go watch it. So he comes to my office. Steve's office, by the way, is this cavernous place. Right. He comes to my office, my little cubby hole, and – <laughs> we sit there and we watch the movie, I mean, a half an hour highlight film, and just me and Steve Sable. Wow. And he gives me some great constructive notes. He really liked the film, you know, and, and it made me feel 10 feet tall. Wow. That's and that's story. the kind of guy Steve Sable was. That's a, that's a great story. That's and great so story. Um, I miss him every day. Um, he, uh, 
you know, um, he, he passed away in 2012. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I went to see him, uh, you know, I was already living in New York. Um, I left uh, to join MSNBC and he gave me, a, you know, amazing, encouraging, uh, you know, hug before I left ML NFL Films, you know, and uh, actually wrote Rachel a great note. Mm. And, and, you know, she, well, she, you know, and she, and she, um, she had written him an encouraging note when he, when he got sick and she wrote him um, and he wrote back and she gave me the note. Wow. Um, and I have it framed uh, in my house. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You grew up a Cleveland Browns fan. Yeah. Um, we, we had a, you know, that's a, a, sad, that's, a sad, that's a bad life. We've choice. had a lot of sad <laughs> issues we've covered so far in this show, but hopefully ones that can turn into inspiration. What yeah. the hell's going to happen with the Browns, man? Like what, 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 what do you, what's your take on, on the Browns? They're, <sighs> I, I say this with trepidation. They're like the Democrats. Like, they always find a way to screw it up. Like, it, you know, it, 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 it really is. Dare, it, I, dare I say this with trepidation? Please. I'm actually encouraged. Okay. Um, this guy Stefanski, Penn grad, by the way. Thumbs up for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fellow, fellow Penn guy. Um, I am, I'm encouraged by the fact that they seem to be all business. I'm very, th very thankful that they got rid of Freddie Kitchens. Thank God, mm -hmm. they had the good sense to. I, you know, I, I, look nothing against John Dorsey personally, but it seemed like he was picking a fantasy team, not mm -hmm. like an actual NFL team that was working together. Mm -hmm. So I'm encouraged to see how they actually construct the roster mm -hmm. going forward. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, people are like, oh, they're one piece away. No. I don't know. Is Baker? We talked earlier about quarterbacks as candidates, right? Mm -hmm. is, is Baker? Is Baker the real deal? Can we can you build it can you build a franchise and not just be a good player, but can he be Eli just retired right yeah. now? Who knows what's going to happen to Rivers and others? These iconic quarterbacks that programs were built around. Yeah, right. And th there's a difference between being a good player and being a pro, you know a guy you can build a program around. Yeah, like is is Baker that guy? I mean, he's he's saying the right stuff now yeah. coming out of coming out of the uh, humiliating season that they just had. Yes. Um, I, he's got to put it on the field. The whole team, for me, like as a fan, look. I mean, they're about to get new uniforms. Thank God. <laughs> really? Oh God. Really? They're okay. Terrible. Okay. Terrible. I mean, who puts who puts the name of your city on the front of the uh, uniform? I know the Jets just did it, and that was I, a mistake. I like it. I like it. I like they, it, man. They're, they're horrible. Okay. Uh, All right. They got to go back. I mean, a, look. I'm a traditionalist. You I know. Hear I mean, you, you got to just just go back to the old ones. You know, just put you know the stripes on the what, sleeves and just. We could do a whole show on uniforms. I oh, think we, we really could. Through all of them. So the Browns occasionally bring you some happiness. Occasionally bring um, you some happiness. But th this is another same with the same with the Indians, the Cavaliers. They got. This I think they're good for me for about a good ten years. Yeah. Thanks for the championship. Thank you, Cavs. That's it. You can run with that forever, right? Whew, thank yeah. God. Well, they do bring you occasional happiness, and this is Angry American. So I want to ask you the question I ask of all my other guests as we wrap up, and they may kick us out of this really beautiful crooked media studios. And again, thanks to. You know, Tommy and, and, and Favreau and Lovett and those guys for letting us squat in this amazing. This is much better than the closet I sometimes record my podcast in. <laughs> and when you come to New York, we'll have you to the car club. But, but Jameel Smith, what makes you happy? What makes me happy? Oh, gosh. Uh, a lot of things make me happy. Um, uh, I think right now I'm enjoying – right now I'm actually enjoying uh, – I've learned to meditate recently. And that has brought me uh, unexpected peace. And I, I, honestly, people are like, oh, meditation. I've been always kind of poo-pooing it. And that, I mean, trust me, man, I, I, it's, it's actually, it's been, it's been really, really helpful. Hmm. So that's been being able to take some time and isolate, I'd say maybe about 20 minutes, you know, in the morning, 20 minutes in, in the afternoon or evening to just, um, you know, more or less take vacation from the world. Um, I just went to Japan for 11 days. Wow. Um, solo trip. That really made me happy, uh, being able to explore this amazing country, um, this environment for the first time in my life. I wasn't in a place that had a, you know, was mostly Eurocentric. Mm. Um, being able to challenge myself with a language that I wasn't familiar with, to learn uh, about this amazing culture and food, and uh, see these amazing, um, friendly folks who welcome me despite all of my awkward attempts to uh, <laughs> uh, navigate my uh, myself around their country. 
um, I really, really, really enjoyed myself there. So thinking back to that trip and meditation, uh, I guess you could say a tie for my top, uh, you know, happiness uh, ranking. That's good stuff, man. We all need a little more meditation nowadays. Yes, and travel. And travel. We could all use a little bit more of that, too. And hopefully, if we have a new president, travel will be a bit more <laughs> enjoyable for yes. the rest of us here in America. <laughs> yeah, and less permanent, perhaps. But, but you, you have travel ahead, and I am exceptionally grateful that you took the time to come in here and, and join me in Los Angeles while we're here. Um, we're going to shoot a live show with Henry Rollins coming up, and this is a, you know, a kind of a makeshift episode of, of Angry Americans, but we have the beer. Yes. Which is great that we continue to enjoy. I yes. gave a six pack to the people around here. Tommy Vitor's dog was running around earlier, so you guys would love to see the outtakes of this. But we do have gifts. So ah. Mercy is going to. Mercy, you got that? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, oh, so man. We got, it's got three phases, okay? So I'll give you, I'll give you the, the, the less sexy stuff first. But All right. If you open that up, you got. Um, Oh. Some merchandise from Angry Americans Beautiful. made by the veterans of Oscar Mike. Not quite Cleveland, but they're in Chicago. Oh. And so you can Beautiful. wear those anywhere you like. It's so a large. Thankfully, I've lost weight. We can <laughs> change the sizes. <laughs> we can get. We don't have any Cleveland Browns colors, but that's. <laughs> Thankfully. Some of the red and black. I hope you enjoy <laughs> that. And then this is, you know, another Ooh. part of our every show. Easter time. Easter's coming again, so now Peeps is coming back around. But this is a question we ask of all our guests. You have three colors in there, Jamil. Yes. I think you do. Yeah, I got, uh, I got pink, I got yellow, and I have blue. Right. So which color would you select and why? Oh, uh, blue. Blue. I favor blue. Blue is one of my favorite colors. Just because you love it? And yeah. it was your car? You had the blue car? I had the blue car. Uh, yeah, blue. I, I mean, I, it's not. Purple is my favorite color, period. It's, it's definitely tops. Um, I mean, pink would probably be this. Sec this, this. But, I mean, if, if this is strawberry, if this pink means this is strawberry, then I would go with I that. I think they all pretty much taste the same. Okay. But there is, this I'm is not a break, big breaking guy. news for folks who listen to the show. There is jalapeno-flavored Peeps, which is either wonderful or disgusting, probably more the latter. But there are new flavors of Peeps that are being rolled out. We may have to do a special show on this. And you know what else is kind of fucked up? What's that? Peeps is not a sponsor of this show. Like, I don't think anybody does more to promote Peeps in America than me. And this show, right? So um, we just do this I because mean, it's such a it's such an American thing. We started around Easter; it's just gone all the way. Everybody answers the question, and now it's a thing. So, I mean, but Peeps is definitely like an Easter thing. Like that's like solid Easter, right? For me. Yeah, yeah. Well, now it's coming back around. All right, and, and also solid is uh, giving you an American whiskey. So oh, this yes. was selected especially for you, um, and it is. I want you to check that out. Oh, this is right. This yeah. is this is a home run. Single malt. Oh, love it. Okay, love and it's it. and it's made in Texas, I believe. But you know, the part of it, it's it's Balcones. It's a Texas single malt. Uh, it is a reserve bottle. It's really cool, and it's you know, part of it is independent character. Mm. And I think that you've been. It's also got a hammer on the front of it, and a star, <laughs> and some other cool shit that, like, you, you know, you. You, I know, are a comic book fan also. Yes, sir. So it's kind of got some, like, awesome superpower-related po points to it. Yeah. But um, you've been out there, you know, banging away. You've been out there making an impact from a really independent viewpoint. You have been bringing that information. And I think you've been really courageous, man. Like, as a friend, I've known you for a long time now. Yeah. And, you know, as an activist, like, it's hard to navigate being an activist and an advocate in the media. I think you've done it really well. Thank like, you. You know, you've advocated for so many communities, people, issues that don't have a voice. Yeah. You've been that voice for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there are going to be folks that look up to you in the same way you did to Sable and Maddow and others. They're coming. Yeah. And you've really, I think, cracked a seal for many of those important voices that are coming in, into media. And, dude, the journey from, from where you started to now, you know, you <laughs> handed me your card and you're, you're Rolling Stone. <laughs> That's got to be pretty fucking cool to hand somebody a Rolling Stone card. I mean, it it, it has not gotten old. Yeah, <laughs> but I but I appreciate you, and yeah. uh, and and I'm so grateful that you came here at this moment in time to have a discussion with us. Thank you, brother, uh, and for joining us on Angry Americans. Well, uh, let me say also, man, it is uh, it is also wonderful to see all the things that you're doing in the world. Uh, you know, keep your head high, man. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen. The great Jameel Smith, live from Crooked Media's really nice headquarters with leather couches and dogs. and we, They didn't have beer, so we brought the beer. But live from Crooked Media headquarters in Los Angeles is Angry Americans with the great and powerful Jameel Smith. Get yourself some good tacos while you're here. Yes. 